Welcome to the Matt Kuda Photography Podcast, a podcast about nature and wildlife photography in your own backyard and throughout the United States. And welcome back to the podcast. I'm here in uh, beautiful North Carolina, it's an uh, absolutely beautiful day today, about 70 degrees, beautiful blue sky with uh, white puffy clouds, and this is episode 12 and this is going to be part one of two parts in Florida uh, regarding Florida bird photography. What I've discovered there and, and why, you know, frankly, why Florida birding has become uh, one of my favorite things to do. I mean, for the bird enthusiast or the wildlife photographer, there is no better place uh, definitely in America than Florida. So I'm going to, like I said, I'm going to divide this episode into two parts. First trip. The first part will be my trip to Gatorland, and the second part will be uh, my trip to Fort DeSoto in Florida. Okay, so before I get started, I just want to welcome all the new folks that have started listening to the podcast. Got some people from Canada, uh, quite a few new followers from Canada, quite a few new followers from Ireland and the UK, so uh, so welcome, and uh, hope I hope this can be somewhat beneficial for all of us. And that's really what I want this podcast to be. I, I, you know, I'm not the best speaker in the world. You know, I'm not the the most intelligent guy that ever walked the face of the earth. But you know, I just want this to be kind of a place where we can help each other. You know, I can give you information that hopefully will help you, and I hope also to get information back from you. So, you know, feel free to to email me anytime you want. I have my email address in the show notes. And I'll try to get back to you as soon as possible. If you have any questions or specifically about wildlife photography, feel free to ask me. And you know, hey, it might it might end up on the show. So, what's so great about Florida? You know, why why all the the talk about Florida? I'm sure, especially for those folks that you know may not be from the United States. You know, what is Florida? Florida is first of all, it's a state within the United States, and it's our southernmost state on the east coast so if i were to divide florida up kind of into sections um what you would see is kind of to the north you have the panhandle it's called the panhandle and then that would go east into the the peninsula itself of florida now what's so interesting about the peninsula of florida is that you have both an east coast and a west coast now why is that important in photography well, literally, if you wanted to, you could drive, let's say, from Orlando west to maybe Fort DeSoto or somewhere in Petersburg. You could literally drive there in the morning, get out of your vehicle, go to the beach, photograph the birds there with the sun over your shoulder, shining directly on the birds, leave there about 10 o'clock, and be over to the east coast at say maybe Titusville and photograph the birds with the sun over your shoulder again as the sun sets in the west. So that alone is a kind of an interesting perspective uh, or interesting aspect of of photography in Florida. I'm going to concentrate on the Orlando area and then east and west of Orlando. And the reason for that is frankly, you know, most people when they're on vacation, they're going to take their families to Orlando. And Orlando has several major theme parks like Walt Disney World, uh, Universal Studios, SeaWorld, and so on. So it makes good sense to look at Orlando and what it has to offer. So if I were to actually you know, go to a map and, and actually zoom in to where Orlando is on a map, and uh, I'll actually put the birding map of Florida in the show notes so you can see that. First of all, smack dab in the middle of Orlando is a place called Gatorland. Gatorland, that that just sounds like a place for gators, right? Well, essentially that's what it is. It's a, uh, I guess a theme park if you will, I wouldn't necessarily call it a theme park, but maybe like a zoo type thing. But they actually have gators there. They they have captive gators. So what do captive gators have in common with birds? 
Well, as it turns out, there's kind of a semi-symbiotic relationship between the alligator and wading birds. So, in essence, wild wading birds and other birds will come to this area in Gatorland. They have actually a little rookery set up in the back of Gatorland. And they will actually come there every spring during the breeding season and uh, make their nests and have their chicks. Now, these are wild birds, but they're attracted to the gators because gators are very predatory. Now, that sounds kind of strange because you think, well, a gator isn't that going to eat the, the bird. Well, yes, they do eat birds from time to time. But they also keep the other predators away from the wading birds' nests. So, you know, foxes and snakes and things like that uh, are less apt to to steal the eggs uh, in this area. And so there are literally, at Gatorland, there are literally hundreds of wading birds that are uh, that are found here. So that's kind of the the rundown of what Gatorland is. What what kind of things can you expect when you arrive there? Well, when you arrive there, there's the main gate, and you go through that main gate, and all the way to the back uh, of the uh, facility is what's called the Gatorland Bird Rookery. And simply stated, it's a boardwalk that actually cuts through a, a large pond. And during the springtime, from say February all the way through the end of May, you will see uh, egrets, you will see both the snowy egret, the great egret, um, you will see herons, like the, the great blue heron. You'll, you'll even see some osprey, some not nesting necessarily there, but you'll see osprey above. You'll see uh, uh, black vultures flying around, you know, little blue herons, all kinds of herons and things there. So my point is that you're basically surrounded by these birds. And in the early part of the breeding season, you get an opportunity to photograph them actually mating and their really bright beautiful colors during that time uh, of course the fights that that occur from rival uh, egrets and so on um, and as as the time progresses what happens is uh, they they tend to start losing their breeding plumage and they're focusing more on actually taking care of their young their chicks that are hatching and this is a great opportunity all you know to, to go ahead and photograph uh, chicks close range and I, when I say close range I mean literally I could be standing uh, on the walkway turn around and within a foot of my elbow where I was resting on on the actual railing there's a nest and that sounds odd doesn't it because I mean when you're in the wild you never get to see this you never get close to a nest once in a while once in a while we do but it's it's not the norm and here it's the norm and so a lot of the images that you see online and so forth of of newly hatched uh, wading birds and so forth were taken at Gatorland or there's another location to the north of there on the coast um, that's called St. Augustine Alligator Farm same kind of scenario uh, alligators protect the birds so on and so forth so what kind of pricing are we looking at here? Because obviously it's not free, right? You, it's privately owned property. Uh, it's not. It's pretty reasonable. Uh, the day rate is twenty six dollars and ninety nine cents as of the recording of this podcast, and you can pay an additional ten dollars uh, on Saturdays, and you can stay an extra hour in the evenings and an extra hour in the mornings, or if you're going to be in Orlando for a week or more, you can purchase what's called the Photographer's Pass. And the Photographer's Pass allows you access, I believe, all year long uh, for $80. Well, not all year long, but all season long. So in other words, uh, March, or February through May. For $80, you can come as often as you want. And it includes late access and early morning access. One thing you have to be careful of is 
sometimes the website it's not intentionally made to mislead you but you have to be aware that this is only Thursday Fridays you can only get early access and not late access and on Saturday you can get early access and late access so that's something to remember when you go there again it's uh, the rookery is available and the birds are there from February 4 to June 12 what I wanted to do now is actually show you some of my images that I took and kind of explain you know how I made them and literally how far each image is away and what setup I used to photograph them so if you go to the show notes and click on the link it will take you out here to my Flickr album and the first photograph here is actually a photograph of a cattle egret in flight and I, that's a bird I don't get to see very often being from North Carolina is the cattle egret this image was taken if if you are facing if you're walking down the rookery from the main entrance uh, this image let me try to explain a little bit if you're walking down that walkway and to the left of you is the pond as you get about halfway down they have another walkway that takes you out or boardwalk that takes you out more into the pond itself this image was taken between that boardwalk and the next one so they have they have these like piers kind of that jut out into the pond if you get in between those two piers what I noticed was that a lot of the birds will come and go from that area and it's a great place to to just sit and get flight shots <clears throat> and the great thing about this is you don't have you don't have to have a 600 millimeter lens it's it's nice to have a, a good zoom available but you don't have to I mean I, I, I took some flight shots uh, there at 150 millimeters I don't necessarily recommend that you only take a 150 millimeter lens but honestly you you can get away with it if you had to if you had to do it you could make it work so this is just an example of just a, a typical uh, flight shot that you can get there I included it because I, I like the subject being the cattle egret and I like the fact that he's actually climbing I, I, I think that's an interesting photograph when they're actually climbing up to get altitude it's it's, it's just like a kind of like a jet airplane taking off to me uh, you'll notice the background the background there can be a little bit tough to work with um, I actually what I did here was I actually darkened the background down in post because those bright green leaves can really be intense um, and they will climb above the tree line also so you can get shots of them with a blue sky in the background and so forth anyway that's my egret shot the next shot is actually what I was just talking about this is a wood stork wood storks have kind of a gliding pattern that they will use when they're getting ready to land and so they'll they'll put their wings straight out to the side uh, photographers often call this a pancake uh, wing spread but in this case it works because the bird is landing he's got his like he's got his landing gears down if you will he's got his legs straight down and the blue sky in the background with the, with the soft focus clouds I think it's just a good photograph I mean I've seen others like this so this is you know this is nothing new okay people make these shots every day there but you know hey it's your shot you know what I mean Th this is my shot you go and you make your shot and I don't you know what who cares if somebody's made this shot before I, I really don't you know this is your art this is your creativity you know you just go with it and be happy you know, that's how I look at it but you know here here's a perfect example of a shot that was taken at 421 millimeters so most people are gonna have a lens around the 400 millimeter range so the shots very doable I I was personally I was using my Sigma 150 to 600 contemporary and I'll tell you what that lens was very well suited for this location I could zoom from 150 millimeters out to you know 600 and honestly I I would have missed shots if I had not had this zoom lens I would have missed several shots I can guarantee you that much so I really like the zoom lens here as well as other locations but here it really pays off well so 
you know, bring that 100 to 400 or rent one, or even if you can get, you know, if you can get the Sigma or the Tamron, go ahead and get it. Definitely money well spent. Okay, the next image is another typical image that you can get here. Um, this bird was very close. Uh, matter of fact, I, I shot this at 228 millimeters. I shot it with my 70 to 300, and you can see just how close and just how detail, how much detail you can get in these portraits. Um, they will, the birds will often land on the on the railings themselves of the walkway, and as long as you don't have a bunch of kids running around, they'll stay there, and you let you get fairly close. Uh, the other thing that you can do here is you can use fill flash. This shot actually uses fill flash. And the reason for that, the reason that you would use fill flash here is if you happen to arrive at an odd time, uh, for example, I arrived here at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, which is not a prime time for photography, you can get back into some, you know, a little bit of shadow and fill in some of that shadow and you don't have that harsh sunlight shining on the bird. So this is an example of a shot that you can get at any time of the day there. It could be blazing hot, uh, sun directly overhead, it doesn't matter because you're basically shooting an open shade. And that's something I want to talk about just for a second here is yes, it's best to shoot at, you know, 8, 8.30 in the morning, 7 o'clock in the morning, or or right around, you know, an hour before dusk or dusk or two hours before dusk. But if you are in a situation that doesn't present that option to you, it doesn't mean you just pack up your bags and go home. I mean, there's still opportunities. And this is a perfect example. So, you know, don't don't always say, well, I have to shoot it at between 7 and 9.30. You know, there there are alternatives. Yes, 7 to 9.30 is the best time I, that, in the world. I mean, it's it's perfect for bird photography. But don't shy away from a location just because you can't get there at the ideal time. Okay, the next image is of a great egret in flight. I love this image. I've seen others similar to this. But guess what? I shot this with 150 millimeters. So what does that do for you? Well, first, most lenses are sharper at 150. They're sharper on their, their lower telephoto end. Not always, but most of the time. It also gives you more depth of field because, you know, the farther you zoom in, the, the shallower that depth of field is going to be. And so here I have pretty much the entire bird in focus. Almost. I mean, the wingtips are starting to get a little bit blurry, but I would call them in focus. So definitely a good opportunity to use a shorter lens. This one was shot 150, 1 12 50th of a second at ISO 320. Okay, the next image. Uh, this image was actually an image I didn't expect to get, but I, I, it's, I kind of like it. Uh, it's actually a black vulture that had landed. Actually, if, if you keep walking on the walkway, it will go down and around and kind of exit the, uh, the rookery. And right in there, there was a I don't know, there's probably 10, 15 black vultures back in there. And I noticed the sun was, was hitting this guy just about perfectly. Uh, it's a little contrasty, like I said, because it's, you know, it's like 2 or 3 in the afternoon. But um, I really I really like this. He's actually preening, but it kind of gives him a, a kind of a sinister and dark look, I think. But I shot this with the the Sigma 150 to 600 at 600 millimeters. And guess what? It's sharp at 600 millimeters. Don't listen to the rumors online about uh, about some of these lenses. They're just not true. Now, one thing I will say about the 600, okay? I, I really love the lens. I love the Sigma 150 to 600, but at 600, now I have not downloaded the latest firmware, but at 600, it doesn't like to focus well with flight shots. Okay, and that's not a big deal. All you need to do is just 
zoom back to about 550 and it'll it'll kick right back in so you're losing you know a little bit off just don't max it out for flight shots just a little tip there for the contemporary lens the next shot is also a typical shot this shot is a great egret in breeding plumage and this is a typical shot that you will find especially in early April and, and even late April you'll still see some of this but if this egret looks nothing like this well I don't want to say it looks nothing like this it has uh, green lures and the lures are just the the little part there in front of their eyes that that joins their beak uh, but in the winter time they'll have yellow lures so it turns green for mating to help to help attract a mate and also if you look down its body there you'll see these long feathers that come off similar kinda of similar to what a peacock has I mean obviously nowhere near that extravagant but it makes for beautiful photographs and and this guy sat there for me he was in shade or not complete shade but some shade kind of uh, I guess open shade if you will and I just whipped out my 70 to 300 shot it at 161 millimeters you know f13 got more depth of field because of the flash 1 2 50th of a second and it looks fine but if you want shots like this if you're specifically going there for shots similar to this one then you really need to think about getting there you know early April you know before they before they lay their eggs and so forth because they'll be doing this and they'll be doing all kind of courting rituals and it's much more interesting okay the next shot um, I like this shot a lot of people shy away from shots of birds flying directly at you one of the problems with birds flying directly at you is it's hard to get a sense of scale with the bird in this case I have a snowy egret that literally it just took off right from the water there and just came right at me I mean it, it flew about maybe two feet over my head I am at 600 millimeters here the autofocus did lock and uh, I'm at one two thousandth of a second but if you look at this image to me you know, one of the things that I find interesting is, again is the scale it almost looks like it could be a gall it's so small it, look, it, appear, it appears small to me but I still like it and those kind of shots will present themselves uh, all day long for you one thing else I wanted to say about Gatorland is that if you're a handicapped person, if you're, if you're wheelchair bound, or you have arthritis, or things that will keep you from, from being more agile, this is the kind of place that you can really take advantage of. Because you can take a wheelchair in here and go down the same walkway that everyone else is using and get a lot of great shots. So I, I really like stuff like that because I know there are, I know that there are wildlife photographers out there that that are wheelchair bound or are getting older and they you know their knees just won't take walking you know three four miles great opportunity right here so that's pretty much it for the images that I took on that trip excellent place just the recap excellent place um, it is a place that many photographers go to so a lot of the shots that you see in magazines and on people's websites and Flickr and so on came from locations like this. So if you're, you know, if you're the kind of guy that has to be out, you know, in the bush and on his belly in mud or you know standing uh, chest deep in the water, you know, this is not going to be a place that you're going to get excited about. But if you're the type of person that they just want good photography, they want good opportunities to to get shots of, of breeding ha uh, uh, breeding rituals and uh, chicks and nests and eggs and so on great place and the price is right one of the things I, I'm gonna I'm gonna talk bad about St. Augustine here for a little bit one of the things I really don't like about St. Augustine is their pricing model and the reason I say that is because a lot of us you know we may go down to Florida on business for example and we may only be in Florida three four days or maybe even two days and maybe we drove down on the way back 
we want to stop somewhere and take some photographs. Well, if you go to St. Augustine and try to do that, they're going to charge you a full price to do that, a full day price, and sometimes they don't even want to do that. That's unpublicized. The day price is unpublicized. They don't even like you to do that. What they want you to do is buy a full membership for the year. Well, I'm never going back there this year. This is my last trip there. Why would I want to spend, you know, close to, you know, $100 for three hours of photography? That's just silly, right? Um, I know there's guys that do it, but uh, I'm cheap, and I, I you know, I, that, bo- that that just bugs me. So Gatorland, much cheaper. You don't get quite the selection of birds. I believe St. Augustine Alligator Farm has a much larger selection of birds. But you're going to pay for it too. And my suggestion is if you're going to go to St. Augustine's, go ahead and plan a week trip there because anything less than that and it's just the, the, it's not cost effective. <music> Okay, welcome to the Know Your Sub- Subject segment of the podcast. In this segment, I'm going to take one animal species and I'm going to discuss how the animal behaves and how you can use this information to make you a better wildlife photographer. I truly believe that in order to be a better wildlife photographer, we must know the subject and know what to expect from that subject. The sound you just heard was that of the black skimmer. Now the black skimmer is a medium sized to large water bird. I don't call it a shore bird because it doesn't spend as much time on the shore uh, eating things from the sand and so forth. The skimmer is unique in that during the early morning hours and early evening hours and also at night they will form flocks and will go out and hunt by literally by dropping their lower mandible or their their lower beak down and they will skim the water you know they'll fly about you know three or four inches above the water and skim that with their beak and try to pick up various food items and so they're unique in that way and they're an interesting bird because of that they have a black uh, back and cap on their head um, it's, it's, which make, also makes them interesting almost, I hesitate to use this word but almost penguin like as far as coloration goes uh, they have white bellies they have very short bright red legs and they have long pointed wings so how do you photograph these birds? well first you gotta locate them and sometimes that's just luck a lot of times it's just luck when you do find a flock of them and they're not hunting but say on the beach what you have to do is slowly approach them and when I, I mean slowly approach them and hopefully you're on a beach that doesn't have a lot of traffic because if you've got any kind of people or dogs or anything walking back and forth they're gonna scare these birds up into the air and then you're just gonna have to get flight shots but if if the beach is empty you can slowly walk what I try to do is let's say I got maybe 30 skimmers down on the beach what I try to do is is, is let them see me and usually they'll they, at some point during your approach they may take off but just wait and they'll come back usually um, what you can do is when you get about 10 to 20 feet away go ahead and drop down slowly onto your belly and just wait there and they'll settle down and you can tell that they're accepting you because they'll go back to their regular behaviors. They'll start preening. They'll go to sleep. You know, Moose Peterson said, when a bird goes to sleep, that's a big compliment because they are no longer afraid of you. And that's exactly what we want as photographers. So as you're on your belly and they're getting used to you, go ahead and snap a few more distant environmental photographs. And then as they get used to you, go ahead and push your, you know, go ahead and kind of crawl and push your way along the sand 
and then stop and then wait again for them to get comfortable take a few more shots and just keep repeating that pattern until you get within the range of your lens I recommend uh, you know at least a 500 millimeter here because any lens shorter than that and you're really risking the birds just taking off and never coming back but if you do it right and you do it slowly you will get close and you will get some pretty good photographs I guarantee you now as far as flight photographs this one gets a little trickier because oftentimes they're hunting in low light and that's a uh, low light is a photographer's nightmare so you may end up photographing them with higher ISOs to get the, the higher shutter speeds or what a lot of people will do with skimmers is they'll pan them so they'll drop their shutter speed way down and they'll pan with the bird which can be very interesting as well so keep that in mind as a possibility well that was a lot of information on Gatorland uh, next week we're gonna talk about Fort DeSoto and just a little teaser for that one Fort DeSoto is on the west coast of Florida and I was pleasantly surprised by what I found there so tune in next week and or not next week but a couple weeks from now for the next episode and uh, I think you'll enjoy it I think you'll enjoy it and it'll, it'll kinda give you a uh, an idea of what to expect there so sadly that brings me to the close of another episode but before I go again I would love to hear from you if you are listening to this show and you like it or you wanna you wanna uh, see a different kind of segment please by all means email me I'll leave my email in the show notes also you I'll just give it to you right now it's matt.cuda c-u-d-a at mattcuda.com alright so that's it thanks for listening make it a great day and get out there and enjoy nature bye bye Music for this episode was provided by Dr. Turtle.